Good afternoon, everyone. Um, no, it's still morning, sorry. It's morning. It's morning. It's good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to be with you all in the Generation Project and, um, and we're live. And to everyone on Facebook Live that's viewing, thank you so much for viewing with us. And we're getting used to being back together in a physical space. And so the daredevils amongst us, or the the dare saints <laughs> amongst us, we have ventured out leading the way. So it's great to be here. But we are mindful of everyone, and we want to say how to love you and how good it is to be here. So let's pray, my God, to be with us for our time of reflection. God, our beloved parent, the one who cares for us with a care that knows no limit, that has no end, that's absolutely and totally unconditional. We thank you so much for looking after us, for seeing us through. Lord, we thank you and we remember Granddad this morning, yes, who is in a very special place with you. And Lord, we couldn't gather together without saying thank you for your everyday grace. We're grateful for him, his life. Thank you for his bigness. Thank you for the memories we all hold of him as a loving, caring, benevolent presence in all of our lives. And also, we remember everyone that this virus has taken from us. We ask that you would comfort and strengthen the families who are mourning. We also thank you for the gifts that this virus has given to us. The ability to be virtual, the ability to do things we never thought possible. Some of us have been able to thrive, even in amongst the chaos. And we bless you for the resilience that you have blessed us with. And we pray that you continue to bless us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So just reflecting on um, what I could say this afternoon at the first service, um, I want to talk about the first day after a major catastrophe. Um, a major catastrophe in scripture and the first day after as they're coming back. So I want to take you back to the book of Genesis, um, the writing called Genesis chapter 8. I want to talk about the aftermath, the aftermath this morning. So Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 to Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 7. The text says, the Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal, and, sorry, of every clean animal and, and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. <coughs> and when the Lord smelled, this is an interesting anthropomorphism, God smelled the pleasing odor. The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as there, the earth endures, there's going to be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And then the text says, God blessed Noah. And it says, and his sons, but we know Noah had daughters with him. So we say, Noah and his children, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. And the fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth, and of every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the ground, and on the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered, into your stewardship and care they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be free for you, and just as I have given you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat the flesh with its life, but as its blood. For your own life's blood I will surely require a reckoning. For every animal I will require it, and from every and from human beings. Every one for the blood of another, I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in God's own image and God's own likeness, God made humankind. And you be fruitful, multiply, and 
down from the earth and multiply in it. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So let's talk about the aftermath. The aftermath. The text that we've read is really the aftermath of what was understood by the editors and writers of this passage as a global catastrophe. And in the worldview or the God thinking or the theology, the God understanding of the writers and editors of this text, the worldwide flood was a manifestation of God's wrath and God's displeasure at human behaviour. And within this framework, any major disaster, within this framework, any major disaster was a manifestation of God's wrath. This is how human beings made sense of calamitous and devastating experiences. Whenever something went wrong, someone had to be blamed and they normally felt that the gods or the God is angry. And that's the way they theologized or thought through their everyday experiences. This is actually a common motif in popular thought. I don't know if those of you who are on Netflix, there's a series called Snowpiercer, which yeah. is based on a film um, and uh, based on a book. And Snowpiercer is this apocalyptic vision of the future in which human beings have messed up and they've released a noxious gas that's frozen the entire surface of the earth. And then of course we have the Terminator franchise, um, you know, and with Judgment Day, Terminator 2, where we're where, with Skynet and we've messed up with empowered machines and the machines are coming to get us. And, and, and then of course 2012 because we had the, the Aztecs um, having a fantasy about the world ending in 2012 and as we approach 2012, um, disaster was supposed to happen and we had all these movies coming out and thank God we survived. <coughs> but it's a popular motif. And so as Noah and his family and their world, including all the living creatures saved by the ark, emerge from the ark, there's a real sense that life must go on. But life can't go on as it has been. We have to change in response to what we've experienced. And so in the aftermath of the flood, we see Noah and his family take some steps towards recovery that can help us think about the ways in which we ourselves return to a new normal in the aftermath of COVID-19. So I want to share with you three things that need to shift in the aftermath of COVID-19 as we move into a new phase of this global pandemic. I think the very first thing that needs to shift is our understanding of God. Genesis chapter 8 verses 20 to 21 says, Then now built an altar to the Lord, and took every king and took off every king animal and every um, clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And then the Lord smelled the altar and said, I will never again curse the ground because of human birth humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, and nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. The worldwide catastrophic flood that Noah experienced changed the way that Noah conceived of God. The God who Noah understood before the flood could not remain the same. So, for example, verses 21 demonstrates the fact that experience shapes theology. My experience shapes the way I see God. Your experience shapes the way you see God. There's something that we see, this is something we see again and again throughout scripture. Natural and political disasters cause people to have different thoughts, different ideas about God. Before the flood, God is so appalled, according to Noah's theology, that God has a fit of absolute outrage and causes a worldwide genocidal flood to wipe out fallen humanity. That's the theology. And in the aftermath of the flood, it seems that the writers and editors of Genesis, uh, particularly chapter eight, 8, have different thoughts about God. What they recognize is that human beings aren't likely to change. The thoughts of human hearts are continually wicked. They're not going to change. And since human beings aren't going to change, 
So since human beings are going to change, what must change is their understanding of God. So the God that is revealed after the flood is the God who says, I will never again curse the ground or the earth because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature. God changes. Their concept of God changes. This is what happens when experience, your experience, shapes your theology. The question I want to ask you in the aftermath of COVID-19 is how is your idea of God going to change? I remember the beginning of COVID-19 on various platforms, we had people praying that COVID-19 would disappear. COVID-19, we had people blowing the breath of God on COVID-19. We had various people binding and loosing COVID-19. And then it became apparent that none of that was going to work. And then we had COVID-19 killing a lot of people from ethnic minorities and the African Caribbean and African American church experienced many members of their churches dying as a result of this disease and our theology had to change. How does your theology change in the light of your experience? How has your understanding of God changed in the light of what you've gone through? In the text, we see that Noah's concept of God expands. So that the God he and his family experienced could never be understood again as flying off the handle of human sinfulness. The God who is revealed in the aftermath of the flood can never again have a fit of anger and destroy the known world. And if human beings are bad, God must be good. Yeah. And God's goodness must continually expand to outpace and outstrip human wickedness so that God and the God I get can never again be overwhelmed by it. Let me tell you, on your worst day, God is still good. In your worst experiences, God is even bigger than your worst experience. In, the, in your deepest, darkest despair, God's love for you is deeper and stronger still. And I want to challenge you that as we come out of COVID-19, your ideas about God, your concepts of God expand so that you no longer have a narrow theology in which God can only do good things and allow good things to happen. Where, where God, the moment you pray, a brick of dabra, a brick of dabra, bad things disappear. But God, who can sustain you through grief, who can sustain you through loss, who stands with you at the beginning and certainly stands with you at the end. The first thing that I think needs to shift in the aftermath is our concept and our thinking about God. I didn't say God needs to shift. Because God is God. Yeah. But our experience brings us to a deeper understanding and a deeper reflection about the nature of God. The second thing that needs to shift in our understanding is our relationship to our planet. It has to shift. The Bible says uh, in verse 22 of chapter 8 and verses 1 through to about verse 5 of chapter 9, it says, As long as the earth endures, there's going to be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, these things aren't going to cease. Then God blessed Noah and, and Noah's children, and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Then, of course, the fear of you, the dread of you, will rest on every animal, and then every moving thing is going to be food for you. And then God says, I'm um, giving you these green plants, and then He talks about um, be fruitful, multiply, and then for your life, God, I will surely require a reckoning. This has been called the Noahic, the Noahic covenant, or the covenant of Noah. The covenant of Noah um, is about a new relationship with nature and our environment. COVID-19, like Noah's flood, 
has demonstrated how delicately balanced life on this planet is. Yeah. Many of the things that we took for granted as being constant, suddenly shifted, like a rug being pulled from under our feet. And we have to realize that we need to be better stewards of our health and the health of our planet. COVID-19 has revealed and re-emphasized the delicate balance that exists between our behavior as human beings and our environment and the well-being of the entire planet. It has also demonstrated that we cannot take, we cannot take our environment and life as we know it for granted. We've got to do better. For example, walks in the fields, trips to the beach, international flights, out-of-town weekends and midweek breaks are all things that we took for granted and now we're having to carefully negotiate as to whether or not they can take place. And when we unravel the thread of what happened to the human family in COVID-19, I am convinced that when we have done the investigation, we're going to find that human fingerprints are all over the development of this virus. Foolishly tinkering with our ecosystem, resulting in this dis-ease. Disease, dis-ease. Somewhere, somehow, we're going to find that someone was in the lab trying to do something and something broke out. That's my feeling. You might call me a conspiracy theorist. But I've, I, I have learned that they're not paranoid, but they are genuinely out to get you. We need to take better care of our world. We need to take better care of our environment if we are going to continue to see seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. I also think that we need to abandon moribund, unhelpful, eschatology that results in disastrous ecology. What do I mean? Much of the Christian world believes that God is coming back any minute now to destroy and fumigate the world with fire. No more water, but fire next time. They believe that our world is currently towards the end of days in which there will be a sudden snatching away of the holy ones and a decisive judgment of the wicked ones who will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. According to these ideas, God is going to fumigate our current world with fire and create a new heaven and a new earth. And so if, if God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, why in the world should I care about this one? God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Come on, Lord Jesus, burn this lot up so we can get on. I remember when Maureen and I were, and our family were moving out of our home. There came to a time, once we had got the house decorated and sell already, just being in that home every day while we were waiting for it to sell, got on our nerves. Because we wanted to move into the new home. So we're sitting down there, can't wait, turn the tap on, can't wait, put the cooker on, can't wait. And I think that kind of eschatology results in our behavior about this world. When we believe that God, God which is actually contrary to scripture. Because God is not going to abandon this world. God, well, the, 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 the prophet and the, the, the New Testament says, and I behold the new heaven and the new earth coming down. Not being burnt up, but coming down. God is about renewing this world. The lack of care about creation and our environment is a direct result of a moribund eschatology. If our earth is old and about to be destroyed, why God no less? Why do we care for it? Why recycle? Why do we care about our ecological footprint? Why don't we buy the biggest um, oil guzzling cars and drive them around? And why don't we build factories and make money while the hay, uh, make our hay while the sun is shining? Not understanding that there is a future that we must invest in. We have to change our relationship to our environment. Genesis 8 and 9 remind us that God will not destroy creation. That's what the Bible says. God says, never again will I destroy the earth. So God says, I'm not going to do it again. And as long as human life exists, there's going to be seed time and harvest. But we could destroy the earth. And like other things, we could blame God for it. 
Genesis 8 and 9 reminds us that God will not be destroyed the earth, and we have an ongoing obligation to ensure the fruitfulness and flourishing of all life on earth. We need to change our relationship to our planet. The third thing I think needs to change in response to COVID-19, and I'll soon be finished, is I think we need to shift our appreciation and value of human life. God says in verse 5 of um, Genesis chapter 9, I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human, that person's blood will be shed. For in God's own image, God made humankind. COVID-19 has demonstrated in fact and in truth that not all lives matter equally. Some lives are more expendable and disposable than others. The scandal of the care home crisis in COVID-19 illustrates the fact that elderly and infirm lives did not matter to our present government. They refused to allow elderly people to be tested. They sent elderly people back into their homes where other elderly people were sick and also infected and died. The health inequalities, particularly in black, especially African and Caribbean and Asian, especially South Asian and minority ethnic communities were laid bare for all to see in COVID-19. We saw the deaths of black and Asian frontline staff of all social classes, all educational backgrounds, all economic backgrounds, with one common, common denominator. These were black and brown people, they were ethnically othered. The access to health and the, socially, and the social determinants of health were not equally distributed and it was going undiscovered until COVID-19 hit and it put it front and center. The disparities also in policing practices and the overrepresentation of so-called black people, and I say so-called black people, People because black is a social construct provided by the powerful to categorize sections of the marginalized peoples of the world. The fatal instances of um, overrepresentation of so called black people in fatal instances of police brutality led to the cacophonous reverberations insisting that black lives matter. You saw that in the midst of COVID 19. There's a comedian, I think he's got a next Netflix special, special called Mike Michelle. Mike Michelle artfully bemoans the fact that we've struggled to get the mainstream of society to acknowledge that black lives matter. 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 Not, not more, not matter more, not even matter most, just matter. That's been problematic for some sections of our community. And it takes a video recorded murder of a man that lasts for 8 minutes and 46 seconds to get the mainstream media to finally break down and concede that black lives matter. Can I just be honest with you? Matter is not in fact a high bar. Mm. If you ask me how I felt about Maureen and how I felt about my children, and I said, Vulnerable. 
And if vulnerable lives don't matter, then no one life, no one's life matter. When we had the Titanic in the ships and even in the airplanes, there used to be a thought that women and children go first. That we, we're already evacuating the ship. We, we, we make sure that the children and women go first. Because what was underlying that thinking was the more vulnerable needed to be taken care of before we took care of anybody else. Jesus said it like this, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me. We, if the least of these don't matter, then I wonder whether or not anyone else matters. As we move into a new phase of life, let us reappraise and change the way we think about God. Let's change the way we care for our planet. Let's radically improve the way we relate to each other, especially by those who are considered, the way we relate to those who are considered the least of these. In the aftermath of COVID-19, let's see us come out with a new commitment to life, in its manifold and very forms. God bless you. Amen.